So welcome everybody to today for Salt Talks Lunch and Learn. Today we are going to be discussing about remote supports or hearing about remote supports and assistive technology um, through Jared um, Hendricks at Safe and Home. So for those who don't know me, my name is Patty Schramm. I'm the parent resource coordinator for the Salt Talks series. Um, we added the Lunch and Learn this year. Um, and then we also have the SALT Teens, which is a student session every month. Um, but wanted to let you know, uh, we're also recording this tonight. So for your own privacy, I mean, you can have your video on, but just to let you know, we are recording it um, and we'll be going till 1230. Um, now, Jared, I'm gonna ask you, do you want, if they have questions that come up, do you, we usually put it in the chat box if they have questions. Do you want to take the questions as we go or at the end? Uh, we can do both. I have a, a, my last slide is, you know, just stopping and giving a few minutes for Q&A. But if you have a question while I'm going, don't feel like you're interrupting me. Feel free to speak up, drop a message in the chat. Uh, Nicole and Paula are here from Safe and Home as well. Nicole's a newer employee working up in Cuyahoga County. And Paula's job is uh, solely uh, working with advocacy groups. So Paula, do you want to say a little bit about what you do and what your purpose is here? <clears throat> Well, Jared is correct. I am the community development rep for Safe and Home, and the position is solely to provide the education that remote supports is available on the waiver system. There's so many um, communication gaps when new services are added to waiver services, so we found that there's a definite need for just education at the point of service, individuals and, and family and national support. So okay. I'm focused on just spreading the word of remote supports and, and the capabilities of independence with it. Thank you, Paula. And uh, so Paula and Nicole, if you guys see someone drop a question in the chat when I'm presenting, if you could speak up and like I said, don't feel, feel like you're interrupting me. That's what I'm here for. And we'll leave some time at the end for questions as well. But if you want me to go ahead, I can go ahead and get started. Okay, I'm gonna yeah, share go my Go right screen. ahead. <laughs> So I'm gonna share my screen here and we're gonna um, start uh, with, uh, I work for Safe and Home if you didn't catch that. So uh, Safe and Home is, uh, we're, a, we're a national company, but we actually, most of our business actually comes from Ohio. When Ohio started their Tech First initiative back in 2018, they reached out to us because we were providing uh, some types of supports for the senior citizen community for aging in place, giving them the ability to live independent. And they were like, we need this for um, uh, people with ID and DD. And um, so we really took our company in a different direction. It's been a great direction for, um, for us and for the people that we serve. And I'm a parent of a 19-year-old um, that's nonverbal autism. So I see the value in what we do. And I have our, some of our stuff here at home as well. But today I won't be talking as much about the equipment and the technology itself, because even though we utilize technology in our solutions, we're not a tech company. Um, we don't consider ourselves a tech company. We consider ourselves a solution company. And our solution is focused on the individuals. We want to we realize that independence means different things to different people. So being able to connect, learn about what they're learning, what their goals are, what their objectives are. That's what that's where we come in and saying, okay, well, how can we use technology to help achieve those things? So um, it's expanding around the country. We're in seven different states right now, looking at um, seven more by the end of next year, at least. So, um, but what I liked about Safe and Home, <clears throat> Excuse me. What I liked about Safe and Home, like I said, I, I could see it from a parent perspective as well when I came on board and um, and came in with the company. And, you know, our focus and our alignment has been with, uh, like I say, staying person centered and the ADA Act and the Olmstead Act, which I, I know you guys are probably familiar with. But, you know, those things that we're putting in um, legislation to prohibit discrimination for people with disabilities and give those same opportunities to people to be involved in their community, to feel safe, to be safe, um, have privacy and make decisions on your own um, and, you know, have choice of your own as well, be able to make your own goals and, you know, you being able to choose how you, how you achieve those things. And when I came on board with Safe and Home, just the mindset of 
uh, what I talked about before that, yeah, we're not, a, we use technology, but that's not what we're about. We're about the person. We're about helping them find independence. We're about helping them achieve goals. And that really spoke to me as a parent. Um, and it's been a great company to be involved in to, and very rewarding to see people when they are able to utilize these types of systems, seeing uh, the difference it makes in their lives and seeing them achieve things that they never thought may have been possible necessarily, but especially other people that thought, oh, I never knew this may be an option or I never knew that they could be able to do this on their own. And, you know, we we know that as, as Safe and Home, we know that people can achieve these things, that they can do these things, that they just may need a supported environment to do that. So we stay in line with the legislation that's out there to help promote independence and make it possible for people. So our mission is simply to empower people with disabilities to live independent in their home and in their community. And um, like I said, that can mean different things to different people. That word independency means different things to different people. Uh, that may mean for some people that they move out on their own, that they're living on their own, making you know, all those choices on their own. For some people, it means that maybe they just have a couple hours of independent time, or maybe they have some support in some of the uh, things they're trying to manage on their own, whether it's, uh, you know, medication management or um, visitor safety, kitchen safety, things like that, that we can still put systems in place to support that person's living environment, support their goals, and help them achieve what independence looks like to them. And, you know, that if it's great, if we, you know, our goal is to, you know, accomplish that goal and then say, okay, well, what can I do next? How can I, how can I further uh, what I'm doing now and uh, set new goals with people and uh, continue to help them work towards those things? So we do that through uh, remote supports and assistive technologies, you know, the equipment itself, of course, but the the equipment isn't as important as the you being able to connect to somebody. Um, and that's basically what remote support is. It's you being able to connect to somebody when you want to, um, you know, that you don't have to have someone there with you all the time, but it, you know that someone is there if you need them. And it's simply at the touch of a button, you can go over on a tablet. Um, you know, it's one of the main ways we connect where you see the picture of the tablet here on the screen where you can do a call with somebody, you can see who you're talking to and we can, you know, answer questions, you can voice concerns to us, we can provide reminders uh, like medication reminders or prompts, but we're never directive, we're never there to tell you what to do, we're there to support what you're doing to help you uh, have supported decision making and uh, encouraging your learning skills that you realize that, and hey, let me think through this, let, you know, and us being able there to support that learning process. <clears throat> So we are not physically there in the home, like I said, where there uh, it's trained staff that are in a, a location, a call center, basically. Uh, but you can connect to them 24/7. So um, if you, you know, a lot of the talk right now is about some of the provider shortages and things like that. What's great about remote supports is that we never take a day off. You know, um, you're, we're always there. If you go over and hit the button, you have someone that you can talk to. And we can put other things in place. I'll talk more about that in our January session where I have um, a little more time with you and I can talk about some of the specific technologies and some of those things of how we can support an environment. Um, but I'll talk to you about those in, the, uh, in January. But what I wanted to talk to you about today is just that we can have things in place to support your living environment, support your decision-making, encourage your safety and help you learn and make decisions on your own. So I like to kind of show this little video of Brandon here. Brandon is one of our customers and um, it's a couple minute long video, but I think it's a great uh, video because it gives a picture of uh, someone who was taking control of his life and some other people that didn't know that it would even be possible. So I'll show you the video and we'll touch base then after that. So. Brandon likes to be busy all the time. He is not lazy, he's gonna do something. He loves to draw, put puzzles together. He does love to walk. He was born about six weeks early and he had hyaline membrane. 
and uh, they had to watch over him for that. And he was underweight, being premature. So it was a while before he got to come home. He was his little tiny, tiny baby. Uh, he would have problems swallowing, and I would be up half the night with him. And finally, we got through that. It shows me that if he wants to do it, he can do it. And if he wants to do it, you're not stopping him. He wants to be even more independent. I mean, I, he, he was telling me, hey, I'm a 56-year-old man. Nobody's got a right to tell me anything. When I first found out that Brandon was going to be needing to move into his own place, I talked to my supervisor about those concerns, and she mentioned remote supports. I was able to contact Safe and Home, set up an assessment that they were able to do for Brandon to see what they might have that would meet Brandon's needs to help keep him safe living independently. I want to be independent. I live with mom out in Hamburger Road, big, big house. How long ago did you move from your house to here? About a year, almost. I like to do apartment by myself. I like to be independent. It's such a comfort to me and everybody else in every area of his life. He is monitored. He had a GPS. If he got lost or something happened, he could use that. The M-Purse is a walkie-talkie cell phone device that he's able to take with him. If he runs into any problems, if he's out for a walk and he might get lost, he's able to call Safe and Home and they'll be able to pull up his coordinates of where he's at using GPS so that they can assist him with getting back home or where he needs to be or alert his call tree which has his mom on it. It gives me a sense of peace because it's like a mama, you know, that's taking care of her child. It's a privacy thing. It's not something that you're noticed. It's not like Big Brother. Uh, it's just something that is there to take care of him when there's no one else that can be there. So that's why I am so happy with that and grateful for it. How's it going? Okay. Most of those stories. Okay, that's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. What do you got planned for the afternoon, Brandon? Um, make lasagna, wash tea. Well, I appreciate you checking in. Is there anything that we can do for you at the moment, or anything yeah. on your mind that you wanted to talk about? I'll just have to be here later. Okay, that sounds good. Okay. Well, I hope you enjoy the afternoon. If you need anything from us, feel free to give us a call back, okay? He needs help and this monitoring system is a comfort and a blessing to me. I mean, I know that he's not gonna, somebody's gonna sneak in or he's gonna get out and we can all lie down and have a good night's sleep because Brandon is safe. So that's Brandon and Brandon, um, Brandon has to deal with what a lot of people with disabilities have to deal with and that <clears throat> they, they want a right to their privacy. They want a right to their safety. They have that, you know, both of those are human rights, but sometimes, you know, with the best of intents, people, you know, that support, um, that are helping support them can inadvertently kind of uh, restrict them at the same time and kind of um, actually end up limiting their privacy and even their activities sometimes because they feel like they're trying to help and they feel like they're trying to keep them safe. And at the same time, they're, you know, sometimes limiting what their abilities are, what they what they what they can expand on in their own independence. And I find myself that even doing that as a parent as well. So I understand it that you know, with my son, that sometimes I'll step in and I'll do something for him just because I see him maybe struggling a little bit to do it, or um, but he hasn't asked me for help, you know. And that, so I should be kind of stepping back and letting him learn. Um, so I understand the instinct to want to help people, but at the same time, we want to put things in place that still promote safety and independence, but in a safe environment, still promotes privacy, um, but still gives that safety net there to say, hey, we're here if you need us. Um, and so how do we provide opportunities for you know, self-determination with that safety in mind? Well, the first thing is that we want to approach it with the right mindset. Um, so we understand that remote supports, we want our remote supports to facilitate a consistent, reliable, safe environment that's encouraging that person's decision-making skills. So if someone wants to wear what they want to wear, 
whether we think it matches or not, or if it's um, appropriate for the weather or something like that, we have to sometimes say, is this, is, is this really affecting that person's outcomes? Uh, we want them to be able to still make their own decisions and say, okay, well, we can help you talk through some things if you have some questions, or we can give you some prompts and uh, help you make some decisions on your own. But we want to be there to encourage those decision-making skills and provide them the opportunity to be determined for what they want to accomplish if they're looking for uh, kitchen safety, um, you know, and they're, they're wanting to learn how to cook more and do more meal planning for themselves. Okay, well, we want to provide an opportunity for that, create a safe environment for that, support that person's decision to um, make that choice. And in that self-determination, we want the decisions to be theirs and not someone else's. We want them to do what you're doing right now, to self-advocate, to be involved in um, and things to say, I want to take charge of this myself. I want to set these uh, goals for myself. I want to learn this on my own. But at the same time, we can say, okay, we, we can help you promote that. We can help promote that. And we can create a safe environment for you to do that. And so we call it supported privacy. Um, and it provides the opportunity to practice those decision-making skills with someone there that, like I said, you can bounce ideas off of, you can connect to when you want to connect to them, uh, ask questions or receive prompts when you need them. And so, you know, it could be anything about how and when you brush your teeth, um, going to sleep and getting up at regular times, watching TV on your own, being able to make choices of what you watch and what you listen to, um, how you plan your meals or having snacks, just creating this decision making uh, that's safe for you, uh, safe for that individual, um, especially when it comes to managing medication. You know, that's a big one sometimes when people are transitioning to uh, learn more independence, you know, taking charge of uh, self-medicating and managing their own medications. And how can we put systems and solutions in place that best support that for that individual? And that's where, like I said, the decision-making skills and safety of remote supports comes in to help you be a self-advocate with that safety net there to uh, ensure that you have support in those things. So how does Safe and Home work? Um, Paula mentioned at the beginning here, Safe and Home is a waiver service. It's an HCBS service. It's available to you through your waiver. Uh, remote supports are, so is the assistive technology. So it's nothing that would cost you anything out of pocket using uh, technologies or remote support solutions, but it gives you the, um, it's in line with uh, HCBS services because it gives you choice. You have your choice in who provides the remote supports. You have your choice to do your daily activities and then you have a support that's there to give you that's non-intrusive where I've said before we're non-authoritative and respectful of you. We're not there to give directions or to tell you what to do. We're there to encourage that decision making. So we can connect you with staff through the uh, through this uh, technology, as you saw in the video there with Brandon, that you can connect to someone, have a face-to-face -face interaction. Even the call button that you saw with Brandon there, it's called Impers in the video. We actually <clears throat> uh, changed the name of it recently to Geocom, but it gives you the ability to connect when you're outside the home as well, to call someone if you need help, give a location of where you're at. Um, and even not just calling us as remote supports, but you can even connect to your natural supports that way and people uh, like parents or siblings or providers that may be part of your care. And then we, like I said, want to engage in your uh, building decision making skills and encouraging your learning through those things. So those are all of our goals and the service that we provide. So. Uh, our staff, I know that question comes up as well. Who's the staff I'm talking to? What, you know, are they trained in what, what I need? And I'll say that whenever we are supporting someone, when we take a call from somebody, if we're um, supporting a living environment for a certain time frame or something like that, we have that person's ISP that comes up that we look at that. We look at exactly um, what that individual is working on, how, how we're to interact with them, what protocols we need to follow for that person. So nothing is ever just cookie cutter. We customize everything to the individual. We build our supports around that person. 
And before we take any person on supports, we make sure every single person in our remote support center reads through that person's ISP and signs off that they understand why we're supporting them and how we're supporting them. That way, no matter who ends up taking the call uh, or ends up making a call to somebody that we uh, have the familiarity with what we're doing. Um, I will say that we try to connect people um, to create uh, kind of a good rapport. So if it's the same person, maybe calling every day at a certain time for a medication reminder, we try to make it the same staff member that's calling them. I know it's not always possible, but just creates a friendly face, a, a good rapport with somebody, builds a relationship with them. Um, but all, all of our remote support staff, not only are they trained in the ISP, but they're trained in ACT as well. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, that's acceptance commitment therapy. So learning how to um, accept people for where they're at, learning how to de-escalate situations and some of those behavioral techniques that uh, we may need to implement in helping care for someone and support someone. So there's all types of solutions that we can be a part of. I mentioned a little bit uh, medication management, but overnight support, if maybe if if you don't want someone sleeping on the couch overnight or something, but you need some providers there during the day to help with uh, meal prep or taking you to the bank or grocery places like that, um, you know, maybe overnight while you're sleeping, you can just have a system in place that's kind of supporting the environment that if something is out of sorts that we can, you know, reach out or you can reach out to us. Learning visitor safety, especially when people are moving out on their own for the first time, you know, feeling safe that you can know who's at the door, that you can follow, uh, you know, that you, uh, you feel safe in your own home. Um, elopement or wandering mitigation, kitchen safety I mentioned, but we have seizure management solutions. I'll touch on the story about that later. Um, emotional regulation, that transition youth and after school support as well. But everything we do, we just want to make sure we keep the person at the center of everything we do. Yes, we use assistive technologies. A lot of those things are sensor-based um, that are just there. You don't have to interact with them. They're just there supporting the home, um, that interaction between our remote support staff. But we also take any interaction, anything that we've done um, with that individual, and we document that in weekly reports that are provided to providers or SSAs, um, you know, whoever needs access to those, we can document any, any interactions we had, any support that we gave uh, so that there is accurate, timely documentation for, for that person's support system. So what we do typically is we'll go into a home, we'll look around the living environment and say, to talk to you as the person to find out what you're wanting, what you're trying, what your goals are, hear from everybody involved, you know, guardians, providers, um, parents, you know, just hearing, okay, let's, let's talk about your specific situation. Let's look at your home. Let's see how we can best support it. Like I said, in January, I'll get into some of the specifics about the uh, technology itself. But for now, we just wanna look at the environment and then even outside of the home, what can we do while you're away from home to still make sure that you feel safe and have privacy and that you feel supported in your, uh, you, while you're in the community? So I won't spend too much time on this because I know our time's short today, but um, kind of touching base before, you wanna make sure that uh, anybody that's supporting you is trained in your care, that they are HIPAA compliant, that they're dedicated to, um, you know, to what we what they're doing to remote supports, and that's what they do. Uh, that they're vetting the technology that's used in in supporting you. There's a lot of people that can say, "Oh, you know, call me if you need me," type of thing. But that's not what remote supports is about. Remote supports is about creating a supported environment, not just a you know, call me if you need me. Uh, I'll put in. I'll give you a phone or a you know, an Amazon device or something like that. That's not what remote supports is about. It's about creating uh, connected technology uh, so that you can connect to a person. <clears throat> so if you are interested in moving forward with something like that and you're like, well, how would the process work? Like I said, we do the consultation. We give a proposal to your case manager or SSA. Uh, if everybody approves it, we can typically install the equipment within a couple of days and then work on you know, our support plan for you that a lot of times can be in place within a week and uh, start those supports and finalize the care plan, making sure that we're 
we're all aware of what we're supporting you in. So that being said, I know I kind of flew through those because our time was limited. I just wanted to leave a few minutes for questions here today. And I will say, I'll give you a lot more detail in January about some of the specific devices, some of the specifics of certain solutions that we offer and how those can work for you. So I look forward to that session in January, but for right now, is there anything um, that you had a question about? That, your uh, presentation covered so much information. It was great. I mean, I had written down some questions, but throughout it was answering every everything that I had. Um, does anybody have any questions? Feel free to unmute or type it in the chat box um, if you have anything specific for Jared. And I appreciate you guys having me here and, you know, hearing these things. I know it's a lot of information, especially if you're new to it, you know, you may had be maybe spending at first, like, oh, where would I start? You know, the important thing is just having the conversation, reach out to me. Um, you know, I'm happy to answer questions. Uh, you have my phone number and email there. If you think of something later, you can always feel free to reach out to me later as well. I think as a parent, one of the things that concerns is when you mentioned the medication, you know, especially if, you know, whether they take it as a maintenance on regular basis or for that illness that they have to tartrate, you know, one of those titrate um, you know, five today, th four tomorrow, three, you know, that kind of thing. It's yeah. like all those were always a concern and when to call the doctor. Sometimes we have found he didn't know when to call the doctor. He'd just go to bed with a fever and never say anything. So, mm -hmm. um, but I think you were hitting on a lot of that. And then visitors, that was another concern. Who do we know is coming to visit our son or daughter? Yeah. And, you know, I'll give you an example to kind of wrap things up. Um, I worked with a young lady. She was 22, I think. <laughs> she was moving out on her own for the first time, and her parents never thought it would be possible. And, you know, they, when they would go on vacation, they always wanted her to come. She wanted to stay home. And finally, one day, they were like, fine, stay home. Let's see how it goes. And um, it went really well. And they were like, well, it went surprisingly well. And then they started looking at opportunities where she could live on her own. And that was important to her. But when we were looking at apartment, her apartment, she was like, well, the one thing I am worried about with living on my own is what do I do if somebody comes to the door? I'm worried about, you know, kind of her three concerns was what do I do if somebody's at the door and I don't know who it is? Uh, I'm afraid that I may forget to shut the stove off after I cook and um, taking her medication on time. So, and she was um, kind of like that where the medication dispenser, the timed dispenser, uh, we have those, but it may not have been the best fit for her because she had to take them at some uh, different times day to day, you know. And so instead of having the dispenser, we just did a video call at certain times to remind her. We put in a stove shut off that if she uh, wasn't around the stove, it senses motion. And if somebody's not around it and it's been on for five minutes and nobody's near it, it can shut off on its own. And it can even send a text alert letting um letting us know that it shut off so we can check in on her and make sure she's okay. And then, you know, video doorbell and uh, things like that, where she can see who's at the door before she answers it. And, um, you know, even talk to somebody through the phone instead of having to open up the door and talk to them. And so just things like that. And she still has provider care. We're not here to take the place of anybody. We're not here to say, no, you can't have a provider. We're here to uh, complement those things, complement the supports that are already in place and find out, you know, how we can just bring it to a new level and help help achieve new levels of independence. And those are all touching on concerns. I know as a parent, you know, we've we've come across or thought about or, you know, making that step or that, you know, going into that next stage. Does anybody have any questions for Jared before we end our time today? I just, you know, he's mentioned January. I did put in the chat box. He is coming back on January 12th to do the, our regular SALT talks um, from 6 to 7.30. So we'll have a little more time, you know, to get into more in depth on this. Um, and also, I just wanted to, we do have our next SALT talk session is in December, on December 8th at 6 o'clock. We're going to have a parent panel on guardianship and um, stable account. Um, there you have a question in the chat. Yeah. Uh, so yes, there are funding sources. I mean, our main 
you know, our main funding source comes through the waiver. But if uh, I've worked with people that didn't have a waiver, they were able to access county funds sometimes. Uh, the county had funds that they were willing to provide, help provide support for that individual. Um, and then uh, we've had some people that use grant funds as well. The, the county was able to get grants for certain things and help put some, certain supports in place. Um, I work with a gentleman who's a, a parolee actually, and um, he didn't have a waiver yet, and but he needed some support transitioning from uh, prison to, um, you know, he did have a disability, but or does have a disability, but he was transitioning from uh, prison actually to uh, to his own apartment and needed some help and support. And uh, so we were able to use some grant funds that the county obtained and um, put some supports in place for him as well. There are, have, oh, go ahead. I was gonna say there are private pay options when you, it's, um, you know, it does, you know, could be expensive, you know, when you get into private pay. I mean, uh, so, you know, looking at, um, you know, just alternate funding sources, being able to connect with an SSA or something just to find out, hey, what resources are available to me? And, you know, that's the important part of having the conversation and seeing how, how they can, how they can help you as well. And your SSA, if for those who may not know, is like a transition coordinator that you may, um, you may have through the your county board of developmental disabilities. Um, if you're not familiar with that, you can email me and we'll you know try to get you connected with that county board. So, is there any other questions for Jared today? It looks like we are all good and we're right at 12.30, well, 12.31, but we did really good time-wise. So that is, you covered a lot of information yeah. in, in a quick time. Uh, we'll be spending more time on it in January. We won't be so tight on time, but I wanted to give everybody a chance to, to you know, hear about remote, just to get, start thinking about it, especially as we're going into our independent living series in January. So it's coming quicker than we expected <laughs> at the end of the year here. So anyway, well, thank you, Jared, um, Paula, right, thank and you. Cole for um, attending today and for presenting on um, the remote uh, remote supports and uh, assistive technology. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Have a good day, everybody.